Here's my do-it-yourself magic image wand. For those of you that don't know what it is, just go Google Pixel Stick or anything like that and see what people are using these things for. And now I will give you a description of how it works. I've done some previous videos. You can see some samples there as well. I also have some of the plans on Thingiverse and on GitHub, and I'll put links in the text below. It has several configurations, um, one meter or two meter sticks. And if you use two, I've got the wires in the middle, and that's going to result in a black line down the middle of your images. If you don't like that, which I agree with, you can run some, take these wires and you can run them out to the other ends instead. And then you can push these right together in the middle. There is a configuration setting in the software for that. So what I'm mainly going to talk about here are the changes to the new version. This is the original. A little bit clunky, but it did work. It has a very small monochrome screen. They used a USB battery pack charger, which turned out to be a problem because they kept changing the size, so they were <laughs> never available. So what I did was I redesigned the thing. So it's like this now. And inside of this, there are two 18650 batteries. Got lots of power and easily available. On this video, I thought I'd go through the new features and also a bit more detail on how the menus work. The original videos that I made were kind of quick. So when you first turn this thing on, you'll see it does a little startup screen, tells you what it is, what version of the firmware you've got. And then it shows you the BMPs that are on the SD card. Uh, new for this version of the hardware, and this is optional, but it does have the battery level and the calibrate. There is a calibration that you can do on the batteries to make sure that they're pretty close because it's difficult to figure out exactly how much battery charge you have left. And anyway, so here's the list of the BMP files. So this rotary dial, the current, the current one is always on the top line, and you can see the thing scrolls as you rotate it. So they are, they are alphabetical, uh, they're case insensitive. And if you see a little um, greater than sign on the bottom, that means it's a folder. So if you go to one of those, uh, let's just look at, uh, we'll look at cars, for example, and you select anything by hitting, by clicking on the button. So now we're in that folder. So the top line shows the folder and a less than sign. The less than sign means that uh, that will go back to the parent folder, go back up one level. So if we want to go back a level, just click on it. Okay. So there's a couple of features that have been added also. There's two buttons over here now. These are the buttons that are on the TTGO chip. So they do various things. So to get in the menu system, you do a long press on here. To go back, you also do a long press. This button here also does the same thing. So you can go back and forth from the menu system with that. There is a light bar feature in here now, which we'll show later, but if you do a long press on the bottom, it goes into light bar mode. And you can't see it right now, but the thing just turned all the LEDs on at a certain color. You do a long press to go back. So the top one does a preview of that file. So if we select a file, and you click on that, it does a preview of the file. So if it's a file that's a little too big, we'll pick one like this lobster, I think is too big, yeah. So you can see on the right it's cut off, so if you rotate to the side, you can, you can rotate back and forth to see the different parts of the image. That's a good way to check what your image is. And doing a long press on the top button rotates the orientation, because sometimes you might have a picture that's upside down, so you, instead of holding the wand pointing down with a one meter strip, you might want to point the wand up, upside down, so the handle's on the bottom, so you might want to do this if you're putting a a ghost in the sky or putting the Millennial Falcon up in the sky, whatever. By doing a long press, doing a long press on here, each time you do a long press it rotates by 90 degrees. It rotates the display. So here it is, now it's upside down. I'll do another long press. Now it's that way. I'll do another long press and it's back to normal. Okay, so let's go over and look at the menu system. So in the menu system, menu items that are used directly that just have nothing in front of them. If they have a plus sign, it means it's, it goes to another menu that has more choices on it. This one here selects the images from the SD card, or if you click on it, it changes to the built-in files, the built-in patterns. So if we uh, do a long press and go back, you can see now we have barber pole, beats, bouncy balls, and stuff like that. 
And these are previewable as well, so if you hit the preview button, you'll see what they actually will generate. This was a feature we didn't have on the original one. Okay, and long press takes it back out of there. So we'll go back to the menu. At the top of all menus, too, there's usually a line that tells you what it is. But the main menu is different. What's on the top of the main menu, it says, it says main menu full. That gives you access to everything. There's also an abbreviated version called simple. So you can see there aren't any more than just these. So it only gives you, you can change between menu types. You can change the, um, change between the SD card or the built-ins. You can change the column display time. You can change the brightness. You can run a macro. You can select a macro or you can put the thing to sleep. Now macros are recordable sequences. So if you have several files that you want to run one right after each other, what you do is you just go and record a macro. There are 10 macros. They're, they're actually numbered 0 through 9. Unlike the original versions, I now have the ability to give them names. So here, here we have uh, two macros. You can see if they're labeled empty, there's nothing in them. But here's some that I've given names. And we'll see how to edit that later when we go a little deeper in the menus. Okay, so going back. So to leave the menu selection, if you want to select this one, you just click on it. And then it says selected menu macro is number one. Okay, so let's go back to the full menu. So there's a name filter now. If, for example, you wanted to find everything that had an F in it, Clicking this uh, top left here will delete the previous character. Once you've got it, long press. Now if we go back and look at them, now we only see files. It, it still shows all the folders, but it, on the files you only see the ones that have the letter F in it. And you can use different combinations as well. So if we go to edit this again, you can see on the bottom there's some help. Uh, if you put letters in with a pipe sign in between, then it will look for either either one or of those letters. So if you put A pipe sign B, it would look for all files with A or B in it. Okay, the next one down is the image settings. And you'll see that has a plus sign in it. So when I click on it, it calls up a different menu. Now one thing I should point out in the menu system is that when you're in a submenu, this button here, the top left one, actually takes you back to the parent folder. And if you were down several levels of menus, if you do a long press on this one, it will take you all the way back to the main menu. So that's a quick way of getting going back and forth. So under image settings and timing type, I'm not going to explain the, all the details here, but uh, column means it'll hold for the amount of time there. All of this stuff is documented in great detail in the docx file that's on the GitHub location. So column time is how long it holds. So column time is, a, is an integer, enter, integer entry common to any others. When you click on it, you get a bar that shows the range, and there's also on the top that shows the range in numbers. So this value can go from 0 to 500, and it's in milliseconds. So if we rotate it, you'll see it goes up by 1. If we rotate to the left, it goes down. If we want to go bigger steps, we click on it. Now the step size there changed from 1 to 10. Now it goes 10 at a time. Click it again, and you can do a reset. Okay, to what the original value was. If you got to some value, you can also reset it with a long press on the top here. Now it'll reset it to whatever the previous value was. As soon as you do a long, long click down here, it accepts the value. So the start delay is in seconds with decimals. And it works very similar, except you'll see here it's doing tenths of a second. And if we click it, now it'll do one second. So now we can set our delay to 2.7 seconds. So this is after you click the Start button before it actually starts to display the image. Okay, Fade Columns, that's uh, used to, instead of the image stopping immediately when it's done with, with columns, it will start fading. So if you set it to 10, for example, then it will fade. When you first start playing the image, the first 10 images will, will start at zero brightness and go up to whatever brightness you've set. And then the last 10 would uh, start fading from whatever the brightness was down to black. So it can give you some soft edges on the start and end. Upside down, you click on it, it's a yes and a no. So if you had an image that you wanted to hold the wand the other way, you just click on it and make it upside down. If you have the display set to upside down, like I showed you earlier, then this is automatically set because it assumes that you want it that way. Uh, when an image is showing, the dial normally doesn't do anything, but you can set this 
so that you can change the brightness manually by rotating the dial while the image is being displayed. Uh, you can also change the speed, in other words, the, um, the frame time. So that way you could speed up and slow down parts of an image. Okay. Uh, you can switch it so that you go, so instead of going from left to right, instead of going from right to left, you might want to go left to right. This will then change that. So if for some reason you wanted to go the other way or your image was backwards, this would, this would mirror image it. Uh, mirror image, play mirror image is yes or no. Uh, if you select that, then your image will be played twice. Once in normal and then the second time in reverse. So for example, one of the examples in here is, is an angel wing. So this way, if you set this on there, it'll do the angel wing for the right side and then it'll immediately do it for the left side. That way you don't have to duplicate things in the actual image file. Scale height, if you have one that was made for um, 288 pixels, for example, and then you want to run it on uh, 144 because you only have one strip hooked up, this would take care of scaling that down to fit. 144 to 288 goes the other way. So if you have a 144 pixel, it will double the pixel so it fills the full two meters. You obviously don't get any more resolution that way, but it works. Uh, frame advance, if it's in auto, it just plays. As soon as you play the file, it just runs through the frames. If you do step, then you have to click this button for every for each next frame. Oh, at the bottom of each menu, there's usually a, a back. It has a minus sign on it. That means go back to the previous. You can also click this, what we call button zero. Repeat and chain settings. This is used for repeating. So you can set how many times you want to repeat playing a file. You can set the delay in between. Uh, chain files is whichever file is current, currently being displayed, as soon as it's finished, it will then start the next file alphabetically. It's, it's most useful in a, in a folder. So if I turn it on, then you get some more choices. You can repeat the whole chain. You can chain delay. This, this would be a delay between the running of the chain. And, or you can just wait for a key to be pressed before you chain it again. Okay, we turned on chain files. Now we'll run chain. So it's doing the first one. It shows you which the next one's going to be, as well as which one it's working on. And it'll just run through all the files. You can kill any running job just by doing a long press on the button. Okay, going back to the menus, we'll go up one level. The next one is the LED strip settings. So this is the maximum brightness, and it's set to 25 right now, which is plenty bright for most night photography. Uh, you can go all the way up to 255, but you can't really do that if you turn on a whole bunch of the LEDs because it uses a lot of power. So if you want to have all of your LEDs at full brightness, you will need a power supply of at least five, possibly seven amps. So the built-in one that's in here will only do about two, two and a half amps. So I find it sufficient for night photography. LED uh, controllers, that's whether you have one or two strips. So if I set it to one, then it'll only send out signals for one, one bar, one meter. You can also change the number of LEDs. So the, the WS2812s typically have 144. Okay, the wiring mode, that's where the data lines go into the LEDs. So I put them in the middle because it keeps the wires short, but it does result in a little bit of gap in the middle. So if you have two strips and big pictures, you'll get a black line down the middle in some pictures. So if you want to avoid that, you can wire it differently. There, there are three options. Serial is, there's only one data line, so you actually only use one LED controller. We run the output wires from the first strip into the second strip. So you still got a gap in the middle, but then there's only one data line. The other way is outside. This way you can, this way you run the data wires using this option, you set it to two controllers and then you run the wires to the outside ends. And then when you do this, you can stuff the LED strips right close to each other and you won't have a black bar in the middle. Gamma correction fixes the, the lower intensity colors so they match a little better what we see. White balance, uh, you can set your RGB white balance. Uh, show white balance just turns on some pixels so you can see what the color actually looks like. Rarely used, but possibly. MIW file operations, these are, you can set a start file that either runs something or configures it in a certain way. The associated files is another submenu. These are files that are associated with each image file. So if you have an image file called abc.bmp, this would then, now oh, this, we're looking at biplane, so we'll just say biplane. So the biplane.miw would be another file that has settings in it. So you could set 
the start time, you could set the repeat count, anything that you can set would then be stored. So when you run that particular BMP, you don't have to configure any of your settings. It just reads it out of the file for that BMP. Rarely used, but could be useful. Okay, macros. This is where we deal with macros. This is where you select it. You got, and you can see the names there. This is where you run it. You can also run it from the simple menu like I showed you earlier. Uh, override settings. The settings that are the frame time and the other settings that are used for the, for the display of a macro are actually stored in the macro file. But if you recorded it at uh, 20 millisecond frame time, for example, and now you want to run it at 5 milliseconds, you could then go change the setting to 5 milliseconds and then say override settings. Then it will ignore the stuff that's in the macro file. Clicking on this will turn it into macro record mode. And as soon as you do that, it will start recording everything you do. Repeat, that's how many times you want to replay the macro file. This would be a delay time between each. Information is quite useful. If you click on that, what it shows you is the number of files that are in that macro, the total time for the macro to display at the settings it was recorded at, how many pixels it actually uses, and how far you're going to walk. Okay, so in this case, you're going to walk four and a half meters, and you have to do it in six seconds. If you don't do that, you won't have square pixels. So for some patterns, it doesn't matter. For some other patterns, you might want it to be exact. If you rotate the dial, what you get is a list of all the files. And you can keep rotating it back and forth if there were more files that will fit on the display. Okay, the other useful thing on information is if you click here, it goes into this edit mode where you can see the text. Then you can move around in here and you can click and add more things to it. Do a long click and you go back. A long press, I mean. This just loads the settings out of a macro file. Not sure how useful it is, but I put it in there anyway. This is for deleting the macro. Whichever one is currently selected, this will let you delete it. The reason you'd want to delete it is if you want to change something, if you want to start over, you have to delete it. Because otherwise, if you start recording an existing macro file, it just appends stuff to the end of it. That's done by design because you might want to record part of a macro file and then you think of something else you forgot so you can add it later. There is, uh, the, the description is held in a JSON file. For the, those of you techies, you know what that is. For the rest of you, don't worry about it. If it ever gets corrupted or you want to just redo all the descriptions, you can just use this delete. The macro file, the JSON file will be automatically recreated at boot time if it's not found. The only, so the only thing you lose is whatever descriptive text you have put in there. I should show you one more thing I forgot while we were talking about. When you're previewing a file, let's go down to flames here. That's a, when you preview a file, if you click on it, it will give you information about it. And you can see it's 144 by 900 pixels. And to keep it square, you would have to walk 6.2 meters in about 16 seconds. Okay, going back to our menus. Okay, saved settings. These are, these are the default settings. Uh, so if you put auto, auto load settings on, then whatever all the settings that you change will then be loaded automatically, as long as you have saved them in here. Um, the, there is an exception to that, and that is the number of LEDs and the LED controller and a handful of other settings. They are always saved anyway because they're things that you typically don't change very often. And when you do change them, you want them to stay that way. In case things get really badly messed up, you can try reset all settings. And the very first time you set load one of these, it's probably a good idea to run format EEPROM. What it does is it reserves a, a bit of space for all these settings. Okay, system settings is a bunch of other menus. Here's where you can do display settings. Uh, you can set your rotation, which you can do from run mode anyway. You can set the display brightness, and that's this display here. So if I, oops. You can see how this, I'll run it at 100%. And then there's the dim time. One thing you probably notice is that some of the menus scroll sideways. That's all handled automatically in case the text is too long. So, so you don't have to try and guess what the guy said when he wrote it. This is particularly useful if you translate to a different language where the words are longer. Okay, to display dim time, if I change that, we'll make it five seconds. And now there's the display dim value. So now it's set to 10. So if I don't touch it for five seconds, what you'll see is that they will slowly dim out. All right, menu choice. If you don't like blue, there's a bunch of other colors you can change. 
That's the that's this blue highlight line. There's also the text color. The menu choice either does this blue text bar or if you change it, it just puts a star in front of it for the currently active selection. I prefer the line, but some people might like the little star in the front. Text color is the color that's used for highlighting and for text. I like this color in the dark, but uh, some people might like yellow or even orange. So you can rotate this and see different colors in the top there. Do a long press. So now we've got a nice almost white color. Okay, the run screen settings. This is for the normal run mode. So you can show the BMP. That's the, um, that shows it while you're actually running it. It's probably not all that useful because there is a preview to see what it looks like. But if you wanted to see what it looks like while you're walking, just be careful walking. But then this would show it as it's being displayed. This, the, which one is currently selected is always at the top and it's highlighted. But if you just want it not highlighted, we can change it to normal. So now what you see is it's just the top one. I like the highlighting, so we'll put it back to that. Show more files. If you turn this off, then you only see the one file that's, that's going to be displayed. It is sometimes nice because a little less confusing, but you can't see who's next either. This will uh, either show or not show which folder you're in when you're in the show folder. Progress bar, this is when you're running it. That's that progress bar you see moving across. You might want to turn that off. If you do, you can. Okay, we'll click back. Dial and button settings. This is the direction. If, if you don't like the way the dial rotates, you can make it go backwards. The pulse count, that's just how sensitive it is. So right now, every time you do one click, it moves one menu line or one integer or whatever it's working on at the time. If you set that to two, then it would take two clicks to actually do something. So it makes it less sensitive. It might be useful if you're wearing gloves. Rotate speed, that's how fast it allows you to change things as you're rotating. it. I find 30 is a good number, but if you find that it's moving too fast and you want to slow it down, you can make it bigger. Don't go under about 10 because uh, some of these switches are a little noisy and you'll get uh, double counting. The long press count, that's how much time it uses to cons be considered a long press. So it's set to 40 milliseconds right now. This sets the operation of those first two things that I showed you. I don't know that it's worth changing, but that's what these buttons do in this mode for when it's a long press. Back up here, sleep time. This is, if you set this to like five minutes, then if you don't do anything for five minutes, this will go into sleep mode. It's in minutes, so I don't want to spend the time to do it right now, but it, to wake it up, you just rotate the dial or click it or do anything. The battery settings. This shows you, this is yes or no. You can have the thing automatically go to sleep when the battery is too low. You can turn that battery display off on the main screen if you don't want to see it. Read battery is used for calibration. So if you hit read battery, then it shows you what the current setting is. This is particularly useful to set your 100% your setting. So you charge your batteries completely, put them in, and then see what number this is. And then go back here and you'd set that in this 100% in this 100 battery setting. The low battery one, you might want to adjust that. It takes a little more experimentation. Battery count is normally two. That's what this handle has, but it is allowed for you to have three or four batteries. Okay, the IP address, this is a feature that's not actually complete yet. Part of it is working. What it does is it lets this sky run as a web server. So if you go, go look for MIW, whatever, a bunch of weird numbers after it, then you can go with a web browser and you can open up this IP address. It's 192.168.4.1. And then you'll get a web page with a couple of tabs in it. Uh, the only thing that really works at the moment is the ability to up and download files. So that could be an alternative way to send files to this thing instead of taking the SD card out. It'll be improved later. We're, I'm still thinking about how to do that. Reset all settings does kind of like a factory reset. You can also do a factory reset by pressing both of these buttons at the same time. You can also do another factory reset. If you turn it on and hold this button down, it will do a factory reset on startup. Okay, the light bar, which you can get either from this menu or you can just do a long press on this button here, button zero we call it. It goes into light bar mode and you can't see it right now, but it's, well, let me rotate it. It's showing red. You can change the colors. It's a little too bright for this thing. So it shows that rotating this will change the U if you click on it, then it changes the saturation. Uh, 
And then if you click it again, it changes the brightness. Click it again and it goes and changes the pixels. So you can go from the full wand, you can change it down to only have fewer pixels actually lit. The delay is, what the delay does is let you change the view cycle cyclically. So it just constantly changes the uh, U. It's fun to play with. It could be interesting. It just cycles through all the colors at whatever speed you tell it to. There's some settings you can change in the light bar. If you don't like U and saturation, you can change it into RGB mode or even Kelvin mode if you want. Uh, they look like this. Pixels. The pixels, uh, if you change the number of pixels, you can do it from the middle or from, from the either end. Okay, there's a reboot command here and there's a sleep. So once it's in sleep mode, whether you did this or it did it automatically because you had a sleep thing set, just click it and it'll wake up and go back to normal run mode. Okay, I think that's about it for the menus. I will post along with this the GitHub address and the Thingiverse plans. You don't really need to go to Thingiverse because all of the STL files and the original Fusion 360 files are on the GitHub site.